afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Marvel Movie Talk right here on Geekscape. As always, I am Christian Blatt. Uh, so excited to be talking about X-Men 97, episode 6. Uh, as we go clockwise, uh, our friend Nate Miller is here. Great to see you, Nate. Hi. I was going to say, for the audio audience, <laughs> he waved. <laughs> like this. Uh, I am and- waving. And, for the audio uh, joining us for the first time, uh, her inaugural voyage here on Geekscape, uh, Laura Grafton. Laura, uh, we'll, we'll uh, take a moment to uh, let you explain how uh, I managed to, well, not cold call you, but cold email you out of the blue and be like, hey, you want to talk X-Men? <laughs> yeah, so I am uh, friends and colleagues with uh, Jonathan Andrew DeMann, who I understand has made appearances here before. Yes. Um, I study at the University of Waterloo. My focus is comics and specifically the representation of queer women and abuse and trauma stories. Um, so Storm's arc in this episode fits nicely into that. Um, my Outside of X-Men, my main focus is Harley Quinn, which is always an interesting journey. Um, and yeah, so... Uh, Professor DeMann reached out to me last night and was like, hey, so I hear somebody's looking for a podcast. Can I send your credentials over? And I was like, yes. Yeah. And now I'm here. So it's been fun. Yeah, no, and that that was, uh, and he, you know, he did the book we talked to him about and he's done the, the Twitter account, the Claremont Run, you know, the fact that, uh, you know, he was able to do that extensive study on Chris Claremont's writing. Uh, yeah. Made him a favorite follow of mine on uh, on the, on Twitter. And uh, so we're very happy you're here with us. And I know uh, Eric's just been waiting for me to introduce him. He's been holding his Kane Marco juggernaut uh, action figure in front of the camera. So are we going to get a voice out of you? Is that why you're obscuring your lovely face? With Oh, I'll be here. I'll, it, it, you know, it's surprisingly heavy. This thing, actually. <laughs> I'm glad you called on me finally. It was, yeah. The rest ain't what it used to be. But hello and welcome, Ms. Grafton. Welcome to the well, party. Look, uh, I I thought about going to Brody first, but you looked like you were having trouble with that. Yeah. And you're also <laughs> picking me up at the airport at like 1030 tonight. So I figured, all right, I'll let him put it down. <laughs> well, it, it, TBD. We'll see how you treat me. <laughs> That's a great point. <laughs> nice. uh, and of course, also with us is our friend David Brody. David, thank you uh, for being here today. Thank you. I, I don't have quite the resume as our guest does. I'm not looking to accomplish or help anyone. <laughs> I'm just here to talk about the X-Men. Nobody inspires me. So there you go. I, I wonder, Laura, do they have wacky packages in Canada, which it's a, a sticker collection of uh, products that uh, are, are being lampooned and given a silly name. Think think Garbage Pail Kids, but for uh, for household items that you could buy at the supermarket. Ooh, um, they do have some of that kind of stuff every once in a while. I can't think right. of the name for them off the top of my head, but I do see them here and there. Well, the 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 difference there would be that uh, they would have to market one that uh, specifically uh, cited craft dinner and uh, not macaroni and cheese. Oh, that's right. I've, <laughs> or I, all dressed I've, chips. <laughs> oh, yeah. Now, now that's what we really have her on to talk about. Let's talk about the dressed chips. Just no. Canadian cuisine. <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> There's something Lots of poutine. Said. Yeah. Poutine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll do a we'll do a bonus episode on just poutine. <laughs> so uh Laura, uh, obviously I wanted to kind of start with you and uh uh let's sort of start with this arc that Storm has in the comic books that uh, lasted for uh, a number of years of real time and passage, uh life death, which it starts with her losing her powers. Uh, not entirely dissimilar to how it happened in the comic books, but just sort of what, why this is such a, an important storyline. And uh, obviously it's so important for the creators of the show to handle it uh, properly and carefully. Yeah. Um, so in the comics, the storyline is really an arc of self-discovery for Storm, both in terms of cultural elements, feminist elements, uh, and also there's some heavy queer coding in the storyline as well, um, marked by her transition in her outfit to her more pop punk phase from the traditional storm kind of Mother Earth imagery that we get with her early on in the run. Um, and also just in terms of finding a voice when you're part of a group that is powerless and 
she loses her power so that she's able to represent those folks in these marginalized communities more properly in the comics run. Uh, and towards the end of Life, Death 2, um, in the comics, she doesn't get her powers back the way we see her get her powers back in this episode, but she kind of becomes this self-realization that even without her powers, she has the ability to affect the things around her, to affect the universe, to affect nature, to affect the people in her life, uh, and kind of gets grounded in that reality and that inner strength. Yeah, and uh, I, I think that it's such a fascinating turn for the character, and it, it starts before she loses her powers, you know. Uh, as you talk about, you know, some of the, the queer coding in, in storylines, you know, when she beats Callisto to become the leader of the Morlocks, I think that's a character that, you know, obviously everything had to be incredibly subtle in uh, the early 80s and into the mid-80s, and really during Claremont's entire run, you know, through the end of the night or the early 90s. And uh, I think that, you know, it, one of the most fascinating things is just a few issues later when a depowered storm is able to beat Cyclops to become the leader of the X-Men. You know, the fact that uh, she's like, I don't have my powers anymore, but I'm still better than you, one eye. So uh, <laughs> it's not actually a line of dialogue from the issue. Uh, it's not. Wow. No, it's not, but it should be. It fits in rather well. <laughs> the, the wacky, blown. wacky version would have that line. <laughs> I, I was today years old when I learned that wasn't real. Yeah. Uh, so uh, obviously, you know, we had the first part of Life Death featured on X Men '97 as uh, you know, sort of the uh, I don't know. It was an interesting pairing as we talked about at the time. You know, the uh, the Mojo episode. Uh, I thought that uh, it, it was an interesting choice, and I kind of wondered why they did it. And even here, it, it isn't the entire episode, which. Uh, I'll admit I was a little uh, disappointed. Uh, Laura, Nate, and I were talking before we started that uh, I was not expecting to get a Professor X storyline mixed in with this. I really thought it was going to be Storm's episode. And, you know, in a lot of ways it is. And I think the parallels between the two stories are worth talking about. But uh, what did you uh, think, Laura, when you realized, like, okay, they're not going all in on life death uh, for this episode? <sighs> So I was a little annoyed when they started the life death story arc a few episodes ago. I've been watching this with my partner and I told him like, they need to get this right. I'm going to either like stop watching or turn to hate watching if they don't get this life death storyline, right? Nothing else matters. Um, and when I was watching this and realizing they were kind of detracting from Storm's story a lot, they were making changes to it, some of which are maybe merited because the original storyline, especially in its imagery, has some cultural appropriation elements and things like that. So you want to find a way to address the cultural differences without appropriating things. Um, but you also want to make sure that you're having a female-led story that's actually female-led and all of a sudden making it a Charles Xavier episode felt rushed and kind of like it was detracting from what should have been a storm story in my opinion yeah and i think uh, as we talk about sort of the resolution of that uh it's something we've been talking about uh, really throughout the entire run of x-men 97 is that boy it's happening so fast and they cram so many storylines and they cram years of narrative uh we were a little uh, up in arms about uh just how quickly inferno like almost happened but then didn't really happen right? you know <laughs> I, I i was so excited for the potential of inferno i did a podcast previously on one of the inferno comics and when it just barely was a blip in the radar i'm like this is like 20 issues it crosses over with so many groups and you're gonna make it barely half the episode i don't understand <laughs> well uh I, nate i want to get your thoughts first uh in terms of you know uh I, I think that last week you you started to kind of echo what some of us were saying in terms of the pacing of the show so i want to see what your thoughts are for this episode but let's start with are you familiar with the life death story from the comics it's really Two episodes, uh, sorry, two issues, uh, 198 and uh, 186. Uh, Claremont always talks about how he had a third one planned, but um, his uh, his artist was a difficult collaborator, and we'll move on from there. We'll just leave it at that. Those are not his words. Those are mine. Uh, but, uh, Nate, your familiarity with this story headed into this. Yeah. Um, like I said the last time we talked about this, I, I did read Life Death. It's been quite a few years for me, um, but the visual storytelling in it was always something that was very striking and very memorable uh, to me. So I, I yeah, I'm a big fan, um, understand the significance of it. 
Um, and kind of as you touched on, we had talked about some of the pacing and it definitely it it definitely surprised me um, with how quickly it was kind of resolved. Um, however, I do find myself trying to I, I don't know if it's just because I love the show so much that I'm like um, <laughs> I'm running defense. But I think if I was in the shoes of the creators of the show, I can understand in a first season trying to get as many impactful storylines adapted as you can in a short time, not knowing how successful it's going to be if you're going to have an opportunity to do more. Um, but also I think from the aspect of, for me watching this show, like especially with the gap between the last time this show was on and now this reboot, which is continuing the old show, there's so many great X-Men stories. There's so many. So for me, for them to be able to kind of touch on some of the big ones and and not, of course, at all faithfully adapt them 100% or even 90% or even 60%, but <laughs> right. still get the kind of gist of them and get them mentioned. And if people like them, they can go look and, and read the story and get the full comic experience. Um, I think that's a cool direction to go with the characters, especially with, again, like how many stories there are to tell, especially newer ones um, that some of us older fans that read the older comics, like it's hard to not watch these without bringing in all of the stuff and feelings you had before related to like these arcs and stuff. And I try to remind myself that there are people, you know, like when I watch with my partner who doesn't know any of this stuff. So for yeah. her, life death is just this story, and this you still she still experienced the ups and downs of the character arc just within those two episodes, and it probably doesn't hit the same way it would as if she had read it. But without her having that context, she just enjoyed it. So I think I, I on the one hand, I as a lover of the comics, I do want it like when they do these faith, mm. especially there's been so much like really faithful adaptations so far that. I, I do kind of want that and expect I just want like an animated off the page. Um, but I also try to remind myself that realistically, like there has to be changes made. And I think that it was done in a way that was tasteful to the, the like spirit of the story. Uh, but I will say I definitely was expecting this to just be a storm and forge episode with the adversary stuff. And I was not expecting to have a B story that went along with it. Yeah, or you could argue that uh, the title of the episode ended up being the B story, that life death is sort of the back burner to uh, what Charles is up to. Uh, what you were saying, Nate, about uh, your your partner, and I think that it's it's interesting because for people that are familiar with existing works and going to see the adaptation, we always bring something different to it. The example I always use is uh, my wife went to see all of the Harry Potter movies and enjoyed them having never read the books. And her friends who read the books and loved the books were like, did you understand this? Was well, yeah, yeah, because I saw the movie. It was like, oh, but what about that? I was like, well, yeah, I didn't know that was missing because I didn't read it, you know? And uh, I, I think that for us to be like, oh, okay, this is kind of what we wanted. Uh, I think last episode is a perfect example of just mixing things together that we never would have expected. And uh, yeah, I guess the the pacing is necessary for the sheer volume of stories they're looking to tell. Uh, Eric, I wanted to get your big picture thoughts on a Life Death 2. Uh, it, it was a little bit of a misdirection, wasn't it? Like calling it Life Death Part 2. So on one hand, they're like, okay, all that stuff from last week, we're not going to really get into. And and really, last week's episode was such a game changer that, I, 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 you know, I understand, and particularly in TV writing, like you oftentimes, like you use the episode after a big event episode to be like, okay, well, we got all these other things you got to think about. Uh, we'll get back to it. Just be patient. But I don't want to be patient. Like, uh, you know, like Homer Simpson says, when he wants a gun right away, I want it. I'm angry now. Like, I want to see what's going on right now. But I would have been fine if it was life death. And Charles' story was fine, although oftentimes I felt like it was a touch of Flash Gordon in, in the way the sort of other worlds were presented, which, again, I love Flash Gordon. But in the yeah, different just, way that uh, I love that. Without, without the tremendous soundtrack, I think would be the biggest. Although difference. I will say the soundtrack for this episode, I really appreciate it. I, I okay. watched are you it are you holding the soundtrack to this episode up against the Queen soundtrack to Flash Gordon? Is that what you're no, saying? No, 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 no. Listen. Oh, okay. Listen. I, I, I was about to get up. Who are you talking right? to here, Christian? No. No okay. one would ever try to do that. 
uh, and live to tell the tale. Uh, but I, I think they hurried along life death. I, 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 I remember this was, you know, very much prime real estate for me as a reader of the comic when I was young and it, it, to just, you know, we were talking, how long will they be, how long will storm not have her powers? And for a moment there, I'm like, well, maybe this is just a, a moment of her mind at work. Like, this is just her finding her freedom and, and fighting for it. And then we come back and we'll realize she's still very mortal, very human. Uh, and that's not the case. Uh, the, her powers are back. Uh, and once I got over that sort of disappointment of, oh, they're not going to let this ride for a while, I, I watched that scene again. And I realized it was actually a beautiful sequence. Uh, even the moment of her with the horses after you see her riding a horse at one point and now she's riding flying alongside the horses um it, it had some of the majestic beauty of i sorry for going over to the dc side of the universe for a second though i think you're okay with that tread lightly uh, that. tread lightly <laughs> but but really that first sequence of man of steel when he's flying is something that really i, I wish more of the Zack snyder verse was like that and that's what this had the music just her joy um, I, I, I always loved the punk rock storm. So this version, yeah. though, she's beautiful, you know, it, it's not necessarily quite my storm, but um, I, I do, I think this whole sequence was beautifully designed and constructed and gives us a really interesting angle for future episodes where they're making storm seemingly more powerful than ever. So this idea of like, mm -hmm. they're going to need this version of storm to survive the rest of this season, you know, um, I, I just, a little sad that uh, she's back so quickly, considering how rich that storytelling was in the comic books when she did not have the powers. I thought that's what made it so dramatic. So li little disappointed, though, still a very good episode and still one of Marvel's best contributions to TV. Right. I mean, the, the series continues to uh, you know be a triumph, for lack of better words. Uh, yeah. But, uh, Eric, it's interesting what you said about the Snyderverse, because I thought for you that the defining moment was the extreme close-up of the sesame seed on the hamburger bun in the Snyder Cut of Justice League. Now you're telling me something <laughs> different. I thought that that was what really spoke to you as a, as a filmmaker <laughs> and appreciation of film. It's and how often you find that in a beard when you're eating a hamburger, too. <laughs> I, I know it, I felt the pain of that character. Uh, David, I wanted to uh, get your thoughts as well. Uh, you know, you texted me a little bit uh, before the show. Uh, I know I know you have some thoughts. Uh, the In the comics, we've kind of established that you had tapped out by the time Storm got her powers back. So talk about your thoughts watching this and uh, – you did a you did a little uh, extracurricular reading, from what I understand. Yeah, so I was there for uh, Life, Death One and Two when they happened, which I just looked up and somehow was forty years ago. I, I don't nineteen eighty four. I my god. Yes. Uh, so I did remember them. I didn't remember how she got her powers back, so I went and researched that. And by the way, if if today you that's the yep that's the issue two twenty six. If you Google how did Storm get her powers back, it took me like twenty minutes. <laughs> because almost every result was based on today's episode. I even put in wow. like, well, how did she get her powers back in the comics? And I could not find, I, I did a synopsis at 226 and I finally figured out how she got her powers back. That being said, I would have liked for her to get her powers back the way she did in the comics because in the comics, Forge gave her back her powers and had a redemption arc, which he doesn't yeah. get to have now, right? So he yeah. was responsible for her losing them. He gave them back to her in the comics and somehow miraculously she thought about it and she got them back. No, and no, was, he did he did give them back to her in the hmm. show. She that, just need she just still had the mental block in her mind. Okay. That was so yeah. that's what I at least that's so, how I so interpret it. What they tried didn't yeah, work, right. but it actually oh, worked. Right. Okay. okay. So the thing that I didn't get, and I, I guess it's it's a cartoon, I understand that. She you know, it's not animation, David. I know, it's not right. It's animation, <laughs> right. Right. Well, Back when it was on in 97, here, boy. it was a cartoon in 97 when we could yeah. say that word. That's Sorry. Right. <laughs> anyway, um, she got, she got, she's, first of all, that's my storm, Eric. That's my storm yeah. with the long hair. Right. I love the Mohawk we're, storm. We're going to, we're going to agree to disagree right there. Because, <laughs> well, I, I, she was my, my, my storm, storm for a decade before she got the Mohawk. So my storm was always, and Mohawk. you're a little older than me. So she was your storm. First. That's what I'm saying. I was Dave Cockrum storm. I was John Byrne storm. So to she me, this is storm. Mine. No, I, Exactly. Now, where she got her costume and her hair back from, I don't know. Well, I, did I, wanna, I did want to pose that because I thought that was interesting. Oh, the costume, I, I would almost be like, okay, so 
I, but uh, I want to let you finish your thought before I, I turn back to Laura. Uh, so yeah, I think those are all good questions. Any anything else before uh, we we expand on the yeah. visual change for Aurora? Yeah, I would have liked to have seen the Xavier plot line as part of the B story to the Genosha episode, since they would looks like they were taking place at the same time. Sure. Um, it's it you know because it, because it, really what we saw was delayed or a flashback because it did not happen a week later, right? It happened at the same time. We're just seeing him realize that Gambit's dead or whatever else he realized. So I thought that was a better B story. That there was it. It's it didn't fit with the with the the uh, life death story, which again, as you pointed out, was the title of the episode. And I thought it was going to be much more than that, right? It would be sure. just a lot more of that. But I understand Nate's point brilliantly explained where they didn't know if there'd be a season two. So get everything in. Uh, I just feel like I would have liked to have seen the storyline without her powers, where she becomes the person she became, despite being mortal where she defeated Cyclops and she became the leader of the Morlocks and all, all that great storyline, unless they do a flashback, we're never going to see that. So, yeah. How many times have we seen a movie where they're like saving something for the sequel? And then you're like, well, you never got the sequel. Now imagine if, uh, if we didn't always save everything for the sequel, we would have gotten Terrence Howard as war machine, but instead they saved it for the sequel. Uh, and that is not what we got. Um, so I wanted to talk to you, Laura, uh, specifically about how this was adapted. And you'd said you had some concerns uh, going into it. So what is uh, the verdict now in terms of the adaptation? The, you know, they definitely check some of the character beats. It's just they check them, you know, sort of really quickly. Yeah, they check them very, very quickly. And they... <sighs> I feel like they hit a lot of stuff and they missed other things for me. Like to me, the life death storyline is about this idea of like self empowerment and discovering yourself without powers or discovering yourself with some sort of new identity. And when you just kind of like magically fix her powers at the end of this episode without that extended arc and without the like multi-issue multi-year getting forged to a point where he actually has this proper redemption arc and not just one that kind of happens over two episodes and is barely touched on and you can miss if you blink at the wrong moment in the episode, right? <laughs> um, yeah, guilty. It just doesn't do that kind of journey of self-expression justice. It doesn't do that journey of female empowerment justice. I found it kind of enraging that she went back to kind of her original costuming at the end of the episode because I'm sitting there and when we started this X-Men journey, I'm like, yes, they have punk rock storm it's going to be like queer coded it's going to be awesome and i feel like every episode i'm just getting like more disappointed at the amount of straight washing that's happening with the characters and at the amount of like hegemonic femininity that they're getting forced into and the way the costumes are going back to kind of more of these like scantily clad things and what have you and not just like everyday clothes um and the same kind of thing for me is like happening with rogue i'm not a fan of the arc that they're having with her either <laughs> um but it just felt way way too rushed for what it was in the comics um that said, I do think they did a good job of kind of switching the storyline to the way like that our own mental health can get in our way sometime and of the importance of addressing your inner demons and all of those things. Like having Storm be the only thing that was in Storm's way is kind of powerful and is a type of empowering. It's just not the way we saw it happen in the comics and I'm not, I'm not upset with it, but I'm not happy with it either. I'm solidly mad. Right. Yeah. So I think that, uh, and, and obviously that's the, the risk you run when you're adapting something that has sort of, you know, achieved this kind of status and you think like, well, I'm going to change aspects of it. I, I, I can certainly see that. Um, I, I agree with the, this idea that it was disappointing and also, confusing how she reverted to her old look and the costume. Like I said, the costume, you know, costumes get explained away a lot of different ways. Okay. She used the, the elements, you know, she used molecules from the storm and, and, and she made it. Okay. You want to tell me that it's a superhero story, but uh, I, I didn't know that uh, she had uh, quick growing hair. You know, I didn't think <laughs> yeah. that, uh, that she had some, uh, whatever the, the elements are that uh, make a Chia pet happen, you know, that, that it was like she'd applied those to the back of her scalp. I don't know. Um, 
but I'm, I'm sort of wondering, uh, you know, uh, so let me start with you, Brody, actually, because you, you were saying before that that was your storm. So you're happy with the end result, right? Well, I'm, I'm not happy in the way it happened because yeah. there was no arc to her. Look, I don't care if she has a mohawk or not. That was a period piece thing in the 90s, right? So I, I loved it at the time. I thought it was badass looking. Uh, people don't walk around mohawks quite as much as they do you know, now as they did them. So, but I, I, I grew up on storm with long hair. Okay. I, I'm not, I'm not saying I like the look better or worse, just that when I associate storm, I, I, that's who I think of initially. And then I think of this as a phase of storm that she went through in self-discovery and she needed to change her look. And, and that was a period uh, of her life. Right. But it was weird in the show because it wasn't like time had passed and they showed her years later yeah. where she's like, she's, she's, reaccepted who she was and she grew her hair out. You know, uh, it was all of a sudden I got my powers back. You know, listen, storm was, was Mohawk storm with powers for a very long time in the comics with a badass outfit that matched her. You know, she was storm with a Mohawk. It wasn't like she only had a Mohawk when she had no powers. It wasn't like that's what signifies that she's a mutant again. Right. Her hair wasn't tied to, she wasn't Medusa where her hair was tied to her power. So it, it just didn't make any sense to me that they had to revert back instantly as opposed to showing her an episode or two from now saying, you know, I've, this, I've, I've, I'm comfortable again. I, I feel like storm. I'm going to, I'm going to wear my outfit. There was no need to do that at the end of the episode to make the, I mean, a 12 year old, like she's back. Was that what yeah. it was? It was symbolism for a 12 year old to say, I guess she's old storm again. Um, because that well, doesn't define who she is. I, I, I do. The cynic in me says that somehow, somewhere, there's a, a note from someone in the Disney Corporation that said, just make sure you get her looking like the action figure again as soon as possible. Yeah. I, I would hope that that's <laughs> not where the story came from, but I can't rule it out entirely. Uh, Nate, what do you think about sort of this resolution that, you know, heading into episode seven, now Storm's going to have her powers and she's going to look the way that you know, the classic design for the character, I guess, is the best way to put it. Sure. Um, so, I mean, when the all all that we have seen her of this show so far has been with the Mohawk, even earlier on in the in the season when she had her white suit on, she still had the Mohawk. So right. the Mohawk is not part of the phase thing. It's more of like the the clothes. For, for me, I took it as not that she's reverting. She's just going back to old storm, but that she's kind of leveling up into a different, a newer level of storm. She's accepted herself more. She's become more powerful. She's she not only is powerful because she's an Omega level mutant. She's so powerful because she believes in herself and her own self worth outside of having powers. Blah 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 blah. Whatever. Um, for me, I, I'm really trying to view this lens through the way that the storytellers of of this show kind of put it together. And I'm assuming working backwards, like the last episode was kind of the centerpiece of this season of this story. And so I think trying to figure out, okay, how do we make this work best? Okay, well, we probably should sideline Storm because we can't have too many Omega level mutants there or else like it's going to be hard. Like that whole fight, it goes completely different with Storm there, right? Yeah. So they go, okay, we need to sideline Storm. How do we do that? Okay, well, what if we... What if she loses her powers? We adapt life death, right? Because we already have this kind of sub theme of the the Sentinel dudes with the the bands, and there's all the Forge stuff that they've laid before, right? Like we're continuing off of a continuity that is not from the comics that the books are adapting. So it's never going to be exactly like whatever the story they're adapting is from, because they're the way that where they are when that story starts is completely different than where the show is when the story starts. Um, so I think within the context of the show, it makes sense. I wish, I do wish that it went longer, but I think all of the pieces are there for Forge to go through his mini arc of like, I've come to terms with, I created this technology because I thought I was doing something good. It ended up being used for evil. Not only did it get used for evil, but it got used on someone evil personal to me. Now, the damage I have caused is personally right in front of me, and I'm going to try everything I can to fix it. He fails. He actually succeeds, but he fails. And then we learn that the real issue is not 
whether the technology worked or not. It's that Aurora losing her powers felt like, well, I lost myself because that's all that I was. For me, I see this analogy a lot kind of to, you know, as an art artiste, kind of like a talent analogy, right? Of like Aurora is this incredibly powerful mutant, incredibly powerful, like worshipped as a goddess. She's so strong. Then she loses that power. And we're seeing the arc of her going through, well, what does that make me now? If I if I don't have this talent, if I don't have this thing that people worship me for, like, do I have any value? Am I worth anything? And so I think as far as for a kid show and a, and a cartoon, I think they did a good job of kind of giving us a little bit taste of that. It's definitely not anywhere near the depth of what the book story is but in terms of a way to kind of sideline storm for a little bit and then let her resurface again powerful i think they did it pretty well um i do want to say too i think in terms of the parallel between the xavier story and this story i think it actually makes a lot of sense because one of the things that like the key part of xavier story is him wanting to do this thing which is going to be good for him personally and also be good for space by expanding the empire and helping them be tolerant and stuff right but in order to do that he has to give up who he is and like everything that he's known and everything that he's loved and so i think the parallels of the two of them like battling that with like who am i what matters to me what makes me me i think those stories make sense and i also really appreciate the parallels of xavier talking about the shiar empire going through and colonizing the galaxy and like <laughs> you know creating problems that they then come with the solution to in order to like keep people in line paralleled with forge talking about the natives and the area where they were and like the stuff that was done to the native americans I thought yeah. that was done really well. Yeah, I, so. I want to dive into that. But uh, as you mention it, uh, when he's using the example of, you know, you you kick them out at the knees and then come and help them walk again. It's like, yeah, you know, uh, Charlie's uh, making some sense there. Uh, but I wanted to let you finish your thought. I just wanted yeah. to jump in. I just want to say, too, like the Flash Thompson thing, I definitely agree. There was something Flash that Gordon. was... Flash Gordon, sorry. It felt a little... <laughs> it felt a little... Commissioner Out Gordon. of place especially since we haven't seen any of the space stuff in this season. But yeah. given the context of what we've seen in the old show, it does kind of make sense. And also watching Gladiator with this animation budget was so cool. Yes. Oh my God. That fight scene was so yeah. cool. He no, was just I can't, I can't around. wait to dive into that storyline. Uh, I want to get uh, Eric's thoughts in a moment, but uh, our pal, Daniel drew thinking about the original show, other than the huge multi-episode arcs, how many comic storylines were shortened there? Yes. They had less to pull from, you know, that at that point they had what, like 16 years of new X-Men stories, but they even borrowed from earlier. So yeah, there's uh, so much more to get to now that, uh, it would make sense. And just one other thought from Daniel. They didn't want to assume they'd get more seasons. Nice that we know that season two and three is at least being talked about and is happening. But uh, Eric, I want, before we move on to the space opera part of our soap opera, uh, I wanted to get Eric's thoughts on sort of the resolution of Storm Story. And, and Nate, it looks like you're trying to jump in with I something. do. Real quick, I have one. I, so I just wanted to summarize that by saying, for me, it felt like in the end that Storm was not a return of form, but more of like a level up. And I think what we're going to see a lot throughout this show is a lot of the characters kind of moving more towards the modern. I think we're seeing the end of the X-Men 90s phase is what's happening and kind of the tra transition towards more of like the more later Grant Morrison 2000s X-Men stuff. Well, yeah, there's no one that that's more representative of than Cyclops, but we'll talk about that uh, in a moment. Uh, Eric, I wanted to get your thoughts on uh, sort of the way that this storyline ended and then we'll we'll circle back to, uh, you know, tales from space, as it were. <laughs> right. It, it's interesting. We, okay, we, we're talking about Storm so much here and then you just to take a step back, we realize, oh my gosh, the movies, how they have never oh. come anywhere close to capturing even a thimbleful of what made Storm the most interesting. I get her powers, and I guess her zapping toad in that first one was fun, I guess. Um, even if she had a terrible action line when she did it. What happens to a toad who's struck by lightning? It's like, oh. well, no one ever Why? asked that question ever. <laughs> you know, um, Why are you reminding me of things like this? Yeah, but yes, but that's you're hundred percent right. right. And and so I, this, I, I just hope this maybe indicates when we get our live action storm that they do justice to her. I mean, th this is her character is so rich. The fact that 
we're talking about years and years of a timeline of her story. Um, I, I still, you know, I, I was thinking, weirdly enough, like Friday Night Lights, uh, the TV adaptation. Jason Street and the pilot, who is like the number one ranked quarterback in the whole country, gets paralyzed. And they never, quote unquote, heal him, which they would have done in like a soap opera in like the 80s, uh, like when the evening soaps, like he, he, he's not, he's paralyzed and he has to figure out who is he now. And it's some of the best writing in, on television I've ever seen because it allowed a very true story to come out in very sort of a semblance of real time. I think they missed out on something there with Storm in terms of her, who am I now? They, they, she brought up the question, but in some ways she never really had to search for the answer because the answer was like, oh, don't worry about it. Uh, we'll give you your powers back. It's okay. Um, I do like her and Forge's is really complicated relationship. I, I love how it intercut with uh, Xavier's uh, strange bedfellows on both sides of the galaxy. I, I thought that was really smart. Uh, and and I, seeing her back in sort of full storm form, um, I, I wish I had the elements power to grow my own hair back as fast <laughs> as hers did and as full. Uh, but in the end of it all, they have set her up for, uh, you know, being the leader of this of the X-Men in a way that she hasn't been prior. And I think that's that's I think what the positive of this is. Uh, it's fast. They burn through a lot of pages of some very good x-men writing from the mid 80s and into the late 80s even but um i i, I do feel and, and nate you bring up great points like i think they've had a really good sense of story in this whole season so i think they've been very smart in how they're using pieces of a larger mythology to serve as their season story with the understanding like yeah they didn't necessarily know they're gonna be greenlit for that long so they were smart about it and and i think to see her get reunited with everyone else it's pretty exciting. Like I'm definitely stoked to see what happens next. Yeah. And uh, to take from your example of uh, Friday night lights, we uh, should obviously uh, adapt that concept since we have representation from elsewhere in North America. It's, it's like in Degrassi when uh, uh, Drake ended Drake. up in a wheelchair <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they they then uh, like decided that he would go through some experimental uh, surgery and then he was able to walk at the end. But, uh, you know, we we had Drake in a wheelchair for a long time. And uh, I'm sure that's what everyone was talking about uh, in that era, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, that's all we were talking about. Was I like that you're that translating era. it into Canadian speech. <laughs> <basically, laughs> right? Nobody cares right? about Friday night. Nobody cares about Friday night lights. They, that, that, you know, that that's uh, that's Texas high school football. That's not the Canadian Football League. You know, so. <laughs> to be fair, I did watch both, but I was oh, much yes. more into grassy. <laughs> we'll talk about, the, and I promise we'll talk about the Argonauts later. <laughs> okay. oh, and, and, and can we talk about both Rough Riders? <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> right. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, Laura, before we move on uh, to talk about the Xavier part of this story, uh, I wanted to make sure that there wasn't anything that uh, you felt was worth addressing from sort of this story and the way it was addressed there. Uh, it, what you were saying earlier made me think of like four other things I wanted to to you know, four other roads I wanted to go down. But I like I got to stay focused on this episode. But I want to give you a chance to if there's any more thoughts on on Storm, what they've done and you know where she's going to go forward after this. Yeah, you know, I, I think we've talked about a lot of it rather well. Like, I do highly recommend reading these comics that pair with these stories in general. It's one of my favorite arcs. Like, X-Men X is not my primary thing, but this particular storyline with Storm is absolutely amazing and some of the best work. Well, I'm, I'm going to interrupt for a second. Do they make <clears throat> you say that Alpha Flight is your favorite because it's the Canadian superhero team? No, <laughs> they definitely don't. And Alpha Flight is not my favorite. No. <laughs> I always liked Sasquatch and then they lost me after him. Although I don't yeah. know. Puck was is cool. there anyway. a Zed, a Zed man up in Canada? <laughs> <laughs> I know. I wish that would be so interesting. I feel like there should be. <laughs> Zed flight. No. Yeah. Um, so, but still, even though, by the way, what is your sort of primary, like to you, like your, you, I don't know if it's your favorite, the one that you're most invested in, if it's not X-Men, I'm just at more, that's more out of curiosity. Archie. Yeah, no, totally fair. Um, so I am unfortunately, and I know there's so much judgment. I'm a DC girly. So I mm -hmm. do a lot of. Well, Laura, it was nice having you on the show. And, uh, <laughs> no, no. 
Um, I know. And I'm not, when I'm not doing X-Men, I do a lot of like Batman stuff. And then I also sure. do a lot of indie runs. So I do a lot of work with um, like Sega and that kind of thing. So that mm. that's more my particular bread and butter. I like X-Men for a good time though. Like that is more or less where I am with it is there's so much X-Men. You can't cram it all into anything and it's always entertaining. That's yeah. No, I def definitely agree. So, uh, yeah, I think that uh, it, it it is it was an important storyline when we got the list of the episodes. I don't know a couple months before the show premiered. I'm like, oh my gosh, wow, they're gonna do Life Death. <laughs> I guess this isn't a hundred percent a kids show anymore. And then also, oh, okay, we're getting two parts of it. Uh, definitely a little bit of uh, some disappointment, but I do agree. As we've been talking about it, uh, what Nate had said this uh, idea that, you know, the two stories worked as, as kind of a parallel. And uh, I, I want to talk about sort of the way the episode opens, surprisingly, is not life death, which is what we saw. And, you know, what we were kind of talking about, you know, the importance of last episode, it is very much like reading a monthly comic book to be like, oh, my God, I can't believe what's going to happen next. Oh, this has nothing to do with what's going to happen next. And Oh, okay. And then it could be like months before you'd actually, you know, get the resolution of the story you wanted. They'd be interesting and engaging uh, the whole time. Uh, there were a number of things that happened that uh, I was excited to see. The first was Deathbird. Uh, I, I always think uh, Lalandra's sister is a uh, fascinating character, but I, I also agree that uh, getting to see Ronan and and Guardian. Uh, uh, the idea that we had Ronan and we had the Kree and again, this isn't even cynical. It's just business sense. I'm like, if Disney didn't, you know, engulf Fox, you know, would an X-Men animated series be able to feature the Kree? I, I don't know. You know, the, the awful dark Phoenix movie that came out had a different ending. And then they're like, no, nah, that's too much like Ms. Marvel. So you got to change your ending. Okay, I mean, I Captain Marvel. My apologies to Carol Danvers, uh, but uh, you know, and and as always, with an apology to Car Carol Danvers, will show up binary. But anyway, uh, <laughs> so getting to see these characters, getting to see the Kree, getting to see Ronan, you know, who was such a, an important part of the first Guardians movie, uh, I I was very excited to see them. A little disappointed that it wasn't, uh, you know, continuation of uh, Life Death uh, from there. But I thought, look, I thought it was great to see these characters and we, we sort of touched on it. Um, but uh, Eric, let me uh, let you jump in first, because you're the one who sent me a bunch of these uh, pictures that I'm going to cycle through as uh, as we go along. Uh, yeah, the space soap opera that yeah. was uh, the storyline. Um, it's great getting Xavier back. I, I, we're all thrilled. With it. it is kind of funny how they just sort of like brought him along. It's like, well, we've been working on some secret medicine, and uh, hey, guess what, guys? It worked. Uh, would you like to meet your new queen? And everyone's like, yeah. Princess By the way, I, I, I'll say that uh, it did give us a, a, a note for the timeline of, of this season because we started, it was about six months after the, the old show ended, <clears> and now – they said, uh, well, we've been working on it for a year. So somehow these five episodes happened over six months, I guess, is our takeaway. And, mm -hmm. you know, probably a lot of adventures in between that could be, you know, the comic book tie-in or, or who knows what. But uh, I thought that was interesting. But, yeah, this idea – look, we all always expected him to come back, you know. Sure. But mm -hmm. uh, the fact that this is when it happened was like, okay, I wasn't uh, necessarily seeing yeah, it. That, that was kind of surprising. Oh, well, yeah. By the way, this image here for our, our viewing audience – uh, it's like this, like, I don't know what you call it, some kind of helmet that's kind of a funky shape. And then the, he takes it off to reveal her head and hair make the yeah. exact same shape. Right. With, it's like the, the first I, time they ever revealed that Wolverine's hair sticks up like that. And, yeah. Uh, you know, it kind of matches his <laughs> it's mask. It's not the costume. Yeah. It's the yeah, hair. Yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, okay. So as a professor, and I, I have a professor I know to, to my right or left here, I'm always very confused <clears> uh, by direction on these things. Um I, I do love that that was his secret power. It's like, I know what I can, must do. And then it's like, all right, guys, class is in session. And yeah. I'm like, yes, the power of teaching saves the galaxy. <laughs> and and so on an ego front, that made me feel very strong. <laughs> um, no one's given me an apple in all my years of teaching, I have to admit, though. But I love this imagery. Oh, and the apple stuffed in her mouth was kind stuffed of- Stuffed in Deathbird's mouth, yeah. Yeah, that was great. <laughs> 
but but I, I I enjoyed watching Xavier sort of in this kind of cosmic realm, trying to almost like navigate it. It's like okay, I owe her my life, but I have responsibilities, and and the great questions of like, <clears throat> are you allowed to be selfish? This was it, it's a nice parallel to what um, Jean or who, Jean-ish, whoever it was, you know, uh, Madeline Jean and Scott were talking about. It's kind of like, what do we owe the world? Like, are we allowed to just focus on our child? Are we allowed to be happy? And and I think that was a nice kind of moral quandary. They're throwing it at Professor X right away. It's like, is he allowed to just be happy? Can he just stay in this corner of the universe and not worry so much about Earth? Uh, but as the story progresses, you realize he realizes he can't. You know, when he gets that vision of death and destruction, it, it, it floors him and he realizes, like, he can't keep that out of his mind figuratively or literally so I, I thought the journey was good the space operatic stuff was a little maybe a little much um but it's also the stuff in marvel i never quite liked as much as i like the things happening on earth but that was always my how my taste ran with marvel anyway so not too surprised that i was more excited about getting back to our planet Right. And uh, I jotted down the the line that uh, he says towards the end of the episode, his realization that while I cowered in the cosmos, the unthinkable has happened. And boy, you know, it's so many different angles, but it really does come down to the very simple idea that uh, Stan Lee put forward that with great power comes great responsibility. And the answer is no. You don't get to focus on your child. Uh, Reed Richards and uh, Sue Richards, they have figured that out. Uh, no, they don't get to just raise Franklin and be happy. And yeah, sometimes you too. don't get to see your kid's graduation. You have to go to court. These things happen. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, I, I miss that issue of the X-Men. Oh, yeah. It's a... I know. I, yeah, I know. They face and, an orange hey, nemesis. Sometimes, sometimes your father's a space pirate and he leaves you and your brother at an orphanage. These are the things that That's happen. Right. Um, and then has another kid who was in this episode. Uh, who was in this episode? That was uh, Vulcan. Yeah. Oh, Vulcan. Was... Yeah, actually, I'm glad you mentioned that. That's right. I forgot about Vulcan. Yes, Daniel Drew did oh. notice that Vulcan was in the episode. Yes. Um, what, yeah. uh, what? What is your thought on this part of the storyline, Nate? Sort of getting the Xavier and the Landra storyline that honestly – once we knew they were doing a reboot and they were going to pick it up from the end of the season, we're like, okay, these scenes are coming at some point. I just didn't think they would show up when they were. But what did you think of this actual part of the story? Do you think it's the game or the new story? Uh, so I, I have to agree with Eric that um, the this, this space stuff, is, like when I was reading X-Men as a kid, the Shi'ar stuff was always where I was, I was just like, what is happening? What is going on? Why are we doing this? um reading it back later i i got some of it i enjoyed some of it it's still not my favorite x-men stuff so coming into this like like you said like i knew we were gonna get we knew xavier wasn't dead we knew he was in space we knew we were gonna get some shiar stuff um them coming out swinging with that fight scene was cool again i'm always happy to see the animation team on this show is awesome all yeah, of the fight scenes have been really cool um so i'm always happy to see that it was cool to see ronan you know get whooped <laughs> uh, <laughs> rather then, easily too yeah by the yeah. way ronan has never really come off as a badass on screen i mean no. he did lose a dance off in guardians of the galaxy <laughs> yeah he's been kind of shortchanged so far but um but yeah i mean so i was you know I'm like cool. We're I didn't think expect to get Xavier back this soon, but I'm seeing this, so I'm assuming it means we get Xavier back. It was funny that like didn't isn't the comics isn't this one of the times when he gets to walk again? Don't they like heal him and they give yes. him like a new body and then he, so it was really funny to me that they just didn't do that. They were like, yeah. you can walk, but actually only in a suit. You actually can't walk again. Still, I guess because he's going back to Earth so soon. But yeah. I don't know. It seems like a missed opportunity to have him walk again and then get injured again somewhere you know two episodes later but one thing it, christian one thing i was going to say yeah. with this image above uh for our viewing audience not our our radio audience uh <laughs> I, I i actually really enjoyed the kind of sexiness of these two you know intergalactic characters slightly undressing each other they didn't overdo it but in a way oh, yes they, the, they have tons of armor on so it's yeah, like even the if legs they take coming off, off of it they're still overdressed yeah, yeah did you I've, did you uh did you enjoy Charles saying that he would be a he would bark like a dog? <laughs> uh, I, I I gotta say it was a, a little naughty, 
Uh, they didn't overplay the hand, but I, but I thought at least they were having a little bit of fun with this sort of ridiculousness of the world and the visuals. And, and I think it was actually kind of human moments. Like he actually has a relationship here. Maybe could work, but his, you know, he's conflicted as they all are in the X Men yeah. universe. No, and I mean, uh, if if we know anything from uh, all of Charles's uh, relationships, uh, terrible things happen as a result of them. Uh, you know, the birth of Legion would just be one. That's you just you could stop right there, you know, and it's like, oh yeah, look look what look what came uh, out of all of this. Uh, yeah, so I thought that. Um, you know, it was interesting to see all of this and there's some, I don't know, Death Bird is such a, a cartoony. Yes, I know it's a comic book story, uh, such an over the top character that uh, I did love some of the dialogue she was given. Like uh, he, he wants his Milky Way ghetto to become our throne world. I'm like, that was so, so <laughs> that was so good. Probably my favorite line in the whole episode. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, what did you? Uh, well, I didn't mean to. Hello, everyone. I'm very. It's lucky. all about Christian. <laughs> it usually is. <laughs> um, what I wanted to ask you, uh, Laura. So, what did you think about this part of the story? Like, once you got over the disappointment of, like, okay, we are not getting our storm story. But what did you think of it? I really enjoyed it. Like, it was just a good time. It was well animated. The fight scenes were amazing. Deathbird's wings were like just spectacular. Yeah. Like, I loved any time that she was throwing her wings around. It was just so great. Um, and just seeing, like, like others were saying, the human moments mixed in with this like otherworldliness. Uh, it was awesome i i want to see charles back on earth more than i want to see him in this setting but it was still yeah. just a really neat way of introducing it and the stories did like parallel each other rather well and they both kind of mm -hmm. ended with like storm and then charles realizing what had happened at genosha right so it, it tied in nicely all things considered but i would have loved to see more storm too <laughs> Yeah, no, no. And and again, I think that we, we're we all willing to concede that uh, they knew they had a 10 episode canvas. And while they wanted to do more, uh, they wanted to make sure they could, uh, you know, put all of their best feet forward. Uh, again, our buddy Daniel in the chat with a question. Uh, was Charles getting that vision of death <laughs> the same kind of thing as what Gene and Madeline got? I would say yes. That psychic blast. We still don't know if those were sent uh, by someone or naturally occurring. And uh, we're uh, theorizing uh, Cassandra from the E is for Extinction story being something that we might get. Uh, we we do get uh, Sinister at the end there. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I think that the space stuff is always fun as a diversion. Uh, although I will give the caveat that I love storylines with the brood. Uh, I, I, I know that it's let's just say it's an homage <laughs> to the alien franchise no. but it's still those are still some of the best stories you know the <laughs> you know there's the like the one the early 150s of uncanny the, it's a like dave cockrum just came back and they're all implanted with uh you know with a a a, a brood egg and just sort of all of the characters dealing with it, you know, except for Wolverine is like, Oh yeah, my body realized this shouldn't be here. So uh, I still don't even know how he got rid of it. I just assume it was unpleasant. Um, but uh, yeah, I think, I think, look, we knew we were going to get Xavier back. Honestly, I didn't think it would take six episodes. I thought it was going to happen sooner. I am not disappointed that it didn't happen sooner. I think getting to explore Magneto uh, mm -hmm. at this idea that he is such a complicated character you know he this this is the chris claremont and subsequent creators uh magneto this is not the stanley jack kirby uh magneto of the evil the brotherhood of evil mutants you know so uh obviously he's such a, a an incredibly layered character and i liked the way that uh, charles referenced him um you know, this is obviously similar enough to things that happened in the comic book. I think a lot of us would like to think that Charles wouldn't consider this idea of like, yeah, 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 you, I, yeah, wipe my memory. I, uh, I, I really, I want to stay here. And then I, obviously, you know, he has trouble actually committing to it because he has noticed that uh, the Shi'ar Empire is a little bit problematic and by a little bit problematic, a lot. Uh, Nate, uh, it was, you sort of touched on that earlier, this idea uh, that, you know, they, I don't know, I don't know what empire to comp 
compare them to, but uh, the, I, the Romans, the, the you know the, the British Empire, uh, yeah, really any the of United them. United States of America. What? I'm, <laughs> I'm not familiar uh, with that one. I don't, no, I, I'm not. I don't. Hey, hey, simmer down. You're up supposed there. to leave the Canadian to say it. Come on now. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You're supposed yeah, yeah. to say that. Can you adopt yeah, us yeah. all, please? Yeah, lucky lucky we don't invade you guys. Be nice. <laughs> hey, 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 hey. hey. Um, but no, so yeah, just talk a little bit more about that. Uh, I, I, I wanted to tidy up the storm stuff before we really delve into the Shi'ar Empire. And if I knew yeah. anything as a kid reading X Men, what I learned from Star Wars is that empires are bad. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there. It's funny because, it, especially when I was rereading re a lot of the comic stuff, there is like a lot of through line of that. Of it's kind, it's kind of like a subtext as they're involved with the empire and like as it goes on and they experience more of it, and you kind of get like, oh, maybe they're kind of like controlling all of these other yeah. people, like in a not like. Uh, uh, they're not doing it to be altruistic <laughs> like no. um so I, I i you know i always say go woke go broke and i hate that this show has gone woke and has professor x explaining um how exploitation works but uh, in actuality i thought it was it was really cool it was funny it it made sense within the context of the story i liked his diagram that he put on the chalkboard of like the little heads and then them getting kneecapped and stuff yeah um, that, 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 yeah that part really spoke but, to me I but normally you like people being wiped out normally I just wanna... normally yeah, yeah no okay. normally but but if you can but if you can instead wipe them out just cripple them so that yeah. you can raise them up to be dependent on you that's really that's really the way that's a go. win that's a win yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly <laughs> um so I, I that's why i I was like, there's no way Xavier's going to agree to do this. But I guess if you put it under the backdrop of him understanding the, like, uh, galactic implications of yeah. the Shi'ar Empire and, like, maybe I can do some greater good stuff if I'm here kind of trying to assuage the, you know, the ways of conquering and stuff into something a little bit more beneficial. Maybe I can see him being like, I need to self-sacrifice. So I, I'll consider forgetting everything that i know and everyone that i love um but obviously ultimately he he didn't do it uh, yeah. i do think this is definitely setting up for i mean we're gonna see more of this right like you don't see yeah. you don't get all the characters that we got introduced and see Gal uh, gladiator go off and stuff for them not later to come back i'm sure maybe next season we're doing like fall of shiar empire or something like that it'll be cool to see some of the people in space again um I don't know. Well, I, I am also now. I'm I'm really starting to think with Shiar stuff. Shiar stuff to me says Phoenix stuff. So I'm like, are we getting Phoenix again? Are we doing that again? Yeah. Like they've kind of tried not to retread some of the old storylines too much, but yeah. that's also just kind of X Men stories of just like doing the yeah. same stuff over and over again in a different font. Yeah, no, that's true. Uh, uh, Brody, you sent me some messages for a new Phoenix uh, costume that they're uh, unveiling. And uh, we're like, okay, yeah, but the uh, old two are so just so much better. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, they do retread a lot. That's more with modern comics. Um, Eric, uh, what was your interest in this guy that you sent me a screenshot of him? Uh, talk about who he is for our audio audience and what it was that uh, interested you in him. Oh, I was hoping you guys could tell me who he is. I just love a dude who looks like an owl in human form. <laughs> I have no idea who this is or what he brings to the table, except I, I almost spilled my drink laughing when I saw him appear. Just and imagine he, him as the Newt Gingrich of the Shi'ar Empire, and we can probably uh, move on. Thank yeah. you. Yes, yeah. moving on. There's not much to add. He does uh, look like but, a Newt. Yeah, yeah that's kind of might be my I Halloween do like the character designs. Year. <laughs> character designs are great. I mean, just the you know, from the crazy oh, hair oh, and the fact that the helmets go over the hair, just so much of that stuff. Um, <laughs> Foot custom fit to their weird hair. It's also, the definition uh, that, of helmet hair. Was that like a feather beard that like yeah. extended, yeah. or was that yeah. like clothing? Yeah. Or yeah, yeah. that's like feather beard. Like they're all kind of like half birdie creatures in their alienness. Like it's it's a weird vibe, but it love that. Yeah. Awesome. Best example uh, of it is that. I, I want to get your thoughts in a second, Laura. But uh, again, our pal Daniel Drew uh, with a funny observation. When Gladiator was talking about those two Shi'ar gods, I was remembering the comics from a couple of years ago that featured them, and they were just so douchey. Well, you know, sometimes that's how gods only know how to behave. You know, when when you're either convinced you're a god or maybe you're actually a god, uh, you know, you're not really looking out for people. So the gods must be douchey if you remember that film. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, 
I believe that was the international title for it. Also, the wasn't it the book a Hey Douchebag, It's Me, Alice? What was that? <laughs> I, I, <laughs> yeah, you might, you, yeah, you know what? I, I'm starting to remember now. Yeah. Um, but what I did want to ask you about, Laura, is sort of, you know, just in taking these really big adult concepts like, you know, empires and colonizations and, you know, just these these galactic themes and putting it on a canvas that for to large extent is still for kids. I know that these shows are made for people like us who love this stuff as kids, but again, it's still, you kind of want to be able to have your kids watch it. Um, what do you think about how they try to tell the story of a Shi'ar empire and not just, you know, shrugging the other way, which, you know, some early Cree scroll comics would be like, yeah, 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 but they're the good guys. So it's okay that they do this. Um, what did you think about that aspect of the Xavier story in this episode, Laura? Yeah, no, I actually really liked the way they did that aspect of it. I liked the idea that the answer to colonialization is like continued education. It's making sure that we all know better so we can do better. Um, I was actually talking to my son about this episode before coming on the podcast. He's eight, turning nine in May. And we're discussing this scene specifically and kind of like the ways in which education can help us move in better directions as people going forward and the ways media can comment on it. I was honestly thrilled with that particular scene. Yeah, no. And, and I think that, you know, again, once you come to terms with the fact that they decided to tell these two stories in this episode, uh, I was definitely able to appreciate both of them also for moving the story along. And, you know, then the episode ends and, uh, you know, Trask is running from someone, but then uh, they're sinister to just uh, set up what's coming next. So uh, we can only imagine uh, what we'll get to uh, next week with uh, episode seven. Uh, and, uh, you know, obviously we will be back to talk about that. Um, but before we tidy up, um, Laura, you had mentioned something earlier. Um, I wanted to kind of get your thoughts specifically about this series. The way that the female characters have been portrayed. You touched on Rogue. I thought that the way that they've handled Jean and Madeline has certainly been uh, different uh, from what we're expecting from comics. Do you find it to be particularly problematic or maybe no more problematic than comic book women have been since, you know, the 40s? <laughs> I... I'm not sure I would call it problematic. I feel like it's Disney pulling punches. Like a lot of a, a lot of the stuff that I love when Disney gets its hands on it, it becomes like these kind of muted storylines, so to speak, where they're like, we're only going to like piss off the population in one way. So we'll call you out for your colonialism and the fact that you're like stealing indigenous lands and what have you, but we're not going to like push too hard on the feminist aspect. So we'll like water down our characters a little bit. We'll make them a little bit more like hegemonically feminine. We'll make them more approachable. We'll like have traditional relationships and not queer relationships here. It'll be fine. Uh, and that's, that I think is what's happening here, which can and go in a problematic direction, but it doesn't necessarily have to. And I think it's really too early to tell. Who do you think that uh, they've done the best with uh, a, a male, female, or, you know, <clears throat> otherwise, you know, anyone on this show, who do you feel like the way that this character has been represented in X-Men 97 is the truest to my, it maybe interpretation or just my preference for the character. Does anybody jump out? And uh, I'm going to kind of uh, ask each of us this once uh, Laura answers that. So everybody start, everybody put on their thinking hats before we finish. <laughs> yeah. um, so my answer to that kind of, we touched on earlier. I really think they're doing amazing things with Magneto. Like I love how complex they're making his character. I love that they are showing that he really was coming at the way he moved about in the X-Men universe from a place of good intention and he's willing to rise to the challenge that Charles left him um, and like no complaints with the way they're dealing with uh, Magneto at all the, the others there's some good some bad but I'm really liking what they're doing with Magneto yeah, I'm I'm interested to see if they go full Cyclops with Cyclops. So at the end of the season, mm -hmm. I might have 
I might have a thought about that, but uh, I it's hard for me to turn away from just my excitement for Nightcrawler, who we saw in the opening credits. There were some different scenes and different things. We had Forge in uniform, you know, in the X Men slash X Factor uniform. So there was like all this stuff. I'm like, is all this happening this week? And, uh, no, it's not. But I'm like, it was all in there. Uh, so getting a good representation of Kurt Wagner is what I always want from my X Men content. Um, but uh, I will uh, next go to Mr. Brody, who I understand you had something that uh, you wanted to also tie up. And I'm sorry, that's bad hosting on my part. I'm trying to spin five plates at once. So oh, it's I no problem. I, I, I just had some thoughts on, on the, uh, the Shiar part, the Shiar part. Uh, but I, we bounced around and I didn't want to forget things because I'll forget things. Um, <laughs> first off, I thought animation wise, and maybe it's timing. And because Gladiator reminded me of Omni Man, but it looked a lot like uh, Invincible to me, in terms of the explosions and the fire. Yeah, I had not thought of that, but you're absolutely right. It does. Yeah, it does does really have an Invincible vibe to it. I agree. Minus the blood and the head ripping off, Gladiator was definitely Omni Man, where he's just like beating everybody up. I mean, he's based on Superman, so I understand why he's powerful. But uh, that so that was my. Also, I, I thought that Xavier, all these episodes, was unconscious in a coma, but yet he had time to build a relationship with Lalandra. so then why not contact Earth at some point and let them know you're alive? It wasn't until he was going to get married that he said, oh, let's call the X-Men and tell them the yeah. good news, and it, it seemed like he should have called earlier unless he wanted them to grow, but also he didn't worry about them, so that that seemed odd to me. Well, I think for all of their advancements in technology, the most surprising thing is that the Shi'ar Empire only has dial-up, so he wasn't really able to get online and wasn't able to send. Yeah. Ma- you know, it's a great point. Uh, I mean, they they just have whatever the Shi'ar version of AOL is. Uh, so I think <laughs> that's yeah, it would have been calling. No, ninety-seven. It would have been calling cards. So. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. So he just needed to do ten, ten, two, twenty, oh, yeah. and uh, right. have the mansion reverse the charges. I gotta Gosh. think at least at least twenty-eight, eight. I'm not going to go 14-4. I'm thinking at least 28-8 on that. Uh, no, uh, it's a great point. Um, is there uh, is there anything else on the Shi'ar, or do you want to uh, isolate yeah. a, one of your favorite characters this season? I, I'll, I'll, I'll isolate in a second. The, the last thing I would say about Xavier is that he, in, in the matter of about a minute and a half, he 90% convinced them to change the entire way they've ever lived their lives, and then he gets the psychic blast, and he's like, I can't wait three more minutes no. to finish what I was saying. <laughs> To save the universe, <laughs> I have to leave now, even though Gambit's already dead. Yeah. I, even though just like a couple of minutes of my time, I could fix everything, yeah. I have to go. That yeah. seemed a bit, you know, a bit much to me. Yeah, well, when uh, when uh, Deathbird is Empress, uh, we'll understand that it's because of that moment, that he didn't just take the time to... Yeah, uh, and, and if yeah. these people are so advanced, they couldn't just figure out where he was going? Oh, I see what you're saying, but, oh, you're done? Oh. Okay, then we forget everything you said. Well, school was in session, so... Uh, right, yeah. once the guy in the green suit walked away, we're like, ah, he made some good... Ah, fuck it, let's go to lunch. <laughs> uh, so uh, who do you feel stands out for you in this series, David? I, I think they're doing a really good job so far with Cyclops. It, yeah. He's always had this role of he's in charge, but he's not in charge. Nobody respects him, but they sort of respect him. Uh, he's not the most powerful. He's His power is hard to control. His, they've done. I think the arc he's taken, where he was confident for a while once Professor X allegedly died, and then he was thrown, thrown, in, you know, thrown a loop uh, in a loop because of his wife appears, and it's not his wife, and now yeah. he's angry. He's angry Cyclops, leading to what you're very excited about. So I, I like the journey he's taken in a short time. I think it's been relatively accurate to the the journey he takes in a much longer period in the comics, and I think it's been true to who he has been, and I think he. He's always been someone who fought with who he was and and what his role was. That's why he kept leaving the X-Men. He never quite knew what his place was, even though that was his place. But I'll say the same thing I say every week. If they put him in that stupid helmet, I'm really not going to be happy. I just I don't <laughs> want to see that helmet. Uh, Nate, who uh, jumps out? I was going to say off the page, but who jumps off the screen for you that it, whether it's a surprise or just a character that, uh, you know, you've always had an affinity for. Is there somebody who stands out so far through six episodes of X-Men 97? Um, so we haven't seen that much of him lately, but I think Beast has been to- so totally on the nose and exactly what I wanted that that's worth mentioning. Um, but I'm actually going to say 
Gambit, even though he's dead. Um, I think he was great in all the stuff that we saw him in, especially his, you know, final um, boom. But, like, the stuff with him in Rogue was great, the way he handled himself, you know, yeah. him in his little hot 90s crop top. Like, I think they did a great, <laughs> job, <laughs> yeah. great job with his characterization. Yeah. Yeah, no, Gambit is a it's a complicated character and uh for me it was always like okay, so he's got card tricks and then they go boom and then it took a little while for me to come around on Gambit long after uh the character was introduced, but I agree that he's uh, been a surprise. And we talked about this last week, the most impressive thing about this show is how little a little involvement there is from Wolverine who is like the biggest character, the most marketable. He's half the title of the next Deadpool movie. And uh, you know, he's not front and center. They haven't jammed him into every story. Like I felt like they probably would have, if this uh, were the nineties, Eric, I wanted to get your thoughts before we uh, wind things down. Yeah. And actually that's what I was going to allude to is that I I really like how they've reshuffled this deck. So Wolverine is, but further down on the deck, yeah. So Cyclops, Storm, pardon me. Yeah, I'm glad I I'm, I'm glad so, I went to you. At the, at the yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> um, it's the I, I'm becoming the owl uh, as, <laughs> as I'm molting. Um, so I I think like the fact that they haven't tried to feel the need to put Wolverine everywhere, I think was very smart. Uh, and I think they realized because we've got a really great Wolverine, except for that one movie that was we do not speak of, um, for years. And so I think they've they've been going to other parts of the real estate. They haven't explored enough in the films. Cyclops, I love what they've been doing with him. As we talked about before, obviously Storm, and yeah, Gambit is one of those characters, like you know, always like kind of like a fan favorite. And um, with all due peace and love to Taylor Kitsch. <laughs> this is the gambit we all love and and i uh, yeah he might not be around any longer but if he's not man oh. they gave him a, they gave him a true hero's death so I mean, his uh, his last scene was one for the book so i mean I, 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 i'm I just think, yeah i i think we all know that uh gambit magneto and possibly even the morlocks uh i, I that pretty much everybody will be back uh before the end of the season you know? well next but, week's yeah. episode is bright eyes yes and that's what rogue called cable and I feel like, although I, one of us made the joke, it may have been me, I don't know, last week, like, why would Cable just come back five minutes earlier? Right? Wow. I, I have a feeling he's just going to come back five minutes earlier. Well, that's a great, I didn't even think of that. Uh, time travel is very complicated, though. You know, it depends. Uh, obviously, it depends on what the story is you want to tell, because, you know, I don't want to go down the road too far, but Avengers Endgame decided to make a, a decision with time travel that I'd never seen before, that you can shoot an earlier version of yourself from a moment in your past and not die which is what Nebula did. So I'm like, all right. So I guess that uh, made up science about time travel. Uh, it's actually, it's like Ant-Man says back to the future <laughs> is bullshit. So, uh, but yeah, so that's a, that's actually a great point that uh, it will probably get cable. And then there's a three parter to end the season. Uh, very excited to see where it all goes. And uh, Laura, very excited that you were able to uh, join us today and uh, give us uh, a perspective that, uh, you know, the, the, the less educated among us, and by that I mean me, uh, <laughs> appreciate uh, hearing uh, people who are uh, well-read and uh, more thoughtful about these things instead of like, I like when there's big explosions. I like the guy <laughs> with the claws. But um, if people want to uh, follow you and see more of your thoughts on more things, where can they find you on social media? Yeah, so most social media places, I'm at LL Grafton. Um, and then I've also started, I'm doing a new research project involving Harley Quinn. So on Instagram, I'm at Quantifying Quinn, which is uh, where you can follow that particular project. Uh, I, I feel like you'll have some thoughts uh, after we see Lady Gaga as Harley Quinn and the uh, the Joker sequel. Yes. So. Yeah, I'm ready to hate watch it. It's going to be so fun. <laughs> Eric Connor, where can people find you? 
uh, over at Count Eric Connor on uh, Insta and on X. But also, if you're really bold and you can uh, go over to YouTube, um, I acted actually in a uh, uh, Easter Seals Disability Film Challenge. So it's like one of those one-week film challenges uh, my friend David Radcliffe wrote. Uh, so if you want to see me uh, actually playing a police officer, for the first and probably last time, uh, check out uh, Call the ADA, uh, ADA, over at the Easter Seals Film Disability Disability Film Challenge. Wow. Uh, and hats off to David and his whole crew. They did a wonderful job. As the only one on the panel who has seen you take the stage in Little Shop of Horrors, uh, I am able to sing your praises as uh, as a master thespian, much like Master Thespian himself, the great John John Lovitz. Yeah, listen, the, the, <laughs> if I if I could have a piece of him, I, I my life is well told. Thank you, uh, oh, David thank you. Brody. <laughs> uh, where can people find you? You can find me at Instagram, and I still call it Twitter at David Brody with a Y. Uh, you can find me uh, on the Brooklyn Boys podcast, wherever you get your podcasts. Or if you don't get your podcast, go get them. And uh, <laughs> as you earlier mentioned, as of the 18th, which is tomorrow, the latest Tops T-O-P-P-S uh, set of Wacky Packages stickers comes out. I've got a few of them in there. Uh, go to Tops, T-O-P-P-S dot com and look for wherever it says Wacky Packages. Uh, and uh, yeah, I got, a, I got a couple in there and uh, they keep putting some of mine in every set. So I'm excited about the latest. And Nate Miller, where can people find you? Uh, you can't. You can't find me. I can't be found. It's probably the probably the smartest I am legion. Everybody's had. Yes, <laughs> I'm everywhere. I'm nowhere. Uh, you can find me waiting for the next X Men episode. So, uh, as uh, for me, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Christian DMZ. Now, this show will be airing next Thursday, two thirty p.m. Eastern, eleven thirty a.m. Pacific. I did the math real quick. I did get those right. 2.30 Eastern, 11.30 Pacific. Uh, we will have uh, another guest with us as we are reacting to episode seven. But also the programming note that I have given several times, but I'm assured we'll be ready for all of you tomorrow at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific on Thursday, April 18th. We're going to do a live premiere of the conversation that Eric and I had with Joseph Culp who portrayed Dr. Doom in the live action Fantastic Four movie produced by Roger Corman from 1994. The real um, Fantastic Four yes, movie. Let's the, just call it that. The, the real Fantastic Four movie. The best Doom we've had so far, Joseph Culp. Uh, so please find that tomorrow, and then we'll be back for the show uh, next Thursday as well. Uh, that is all the time we have for now. But uh, thanks to everyone in the chat, which was mostly Daniel Drew today, but I saw some other people in there, and we appreciate that. Thanks again to Laura for joining us. We'll see everybody next week. As the great Stan Lee would say, Excelsior!